Yo, it's the cat, back with more soul stuff. Now that it's been quite a while since Elden Ring came out, I think we're in the post-not-clarity phase. We can look at all the new bosses and compare them to the previous ones without too much recency bias. And those previous bosses are from Demon Souls, Dark Souls, Dark Souls 2, Bloodborne, Dark Souls 3, and Sekiro. However, I wouldn't expect too many from the first few games to make an appearance. Also, before Elden Ring came out, I ranked every single boss from worst to best. So feel free to check that one out before or after this one. Though, like always, some choices there I'd take back. Anyway, let's begin at number 20. Malekith the Black Babe, or at first glance, Beast Clergyman, is a highlight boss from Elden Ring's final couple of areas. And if, like me, you were a little exhausted from exploring the mountaintops of the giants, this boss was such a relief. Although, at first I could have sworn that they forgot to add punishable windows to the boss. But that's half the battle, figuring out when to hit him and not just how to dodge his attacks. Positioning is something I always advocate to be a key component in a boss fight, and that's basically all this fight is. Even more so once he reveals his true form. I'm dirty dog, and I'm the baddest there is. My coronavirus rhyme are the best there is. Oh, wrong footage. Whoops. There, he's actually this lanky, weird emo dog with a death blade, and yeah, wow, he's very cool. In this half of the fight, he's jumping around on pillars and juggling himself in the air in what must be one of the coolest combos FromSoft has ever made. His moves and follow-ups alter based on your position, and it is glorious. I want more stuff like this. It's a shame the fight doesn't tend to last very long. Either because his ridiculous damage output will kill you in seconds, or because by the time you're realizing you're having a lot of fun, he's already dead. I know there are plenty of Malekith fans out there who would have liked to have seen him a fair bit higher, but personally, I don't really have any strong memories associated with this boss. The theme and atmosphere aren't really super compelling to me. It's just a very fun fight and not much more meaningful than that. Soralon is our one and only boss to make it here from Dark Souls 2. You could say, he alone made it. I've been making Alon jokes for like six years, or however long I've been making these. It's really sad. Now, this being Dark Souls 2, you are restricted to having extremely clunky movement and limited stamina, and worst of all, terrible hitboxes without being a heavy ADP investor. But what I love about Sir Alon is that they molded gold out of shit. Despite the deck being stacked against them, they managed to use this game's shitty-ass mechanics to make a brilliant boss fight. Despite how little stamina you can use, the fight is perfectly paced for it. The boss tends to jump back quite a bit, allowing you some time to recover your stamina, as well as just having the right amount of pauses in between his attacks. I feel they struck that balance really fucking well, even better than with Fume Knight, who does sometimes make me feel like I wish he was in a different Souls game so I could fully enjoy it. The music for Soralon is... Like, what the fuck is it doing in this game? Why is it 10 times better than any other track? Oh well, it just helps highlight how absurdly better Sorlon is than everything else that came out of Dark Souls 2. Sok is the final boss of the main game of Dark Souls 3, and for those who played and enjoyed Dark Souls 1, it's another fun callback. But in phase 1 of the fight, he's something completely else. Essentially, he's an amalgamation of all the players who linked the first flame in Dark Souls 1. Because if there's one thing us Souls players love, it's KILLING OURSELVES! He starts out with a greatsword, but throughout he can transform it into a staff for spellcasting, curved sword for pyromancing, and big schlong spear for unwanted thrusting. I fucking hate the spear, if I'm gonna be honest. Which I am. Every other weapon is pretty fun to go up against, especially the greatsword, but... Man... The spear! <sighs> Especially if he buffs himself with the homing soul mass right before switching to it. What an absolute dick move! So yeah, RNG can definitely influence the enjoyment and that's a tad unfortunate. But his Super Gwyn moveset, which is actually kind of easier than the OG Gwyn, I really like. It's just a pure, simple, but really well designed one-on-one -on -one duel and I'm glad you can't parry him. He has a good variety of combos, explosions, lightning, which the OG Gwyn never had for some reason. The music is great, which is something you're definitely gonna hear me say a lot in this video. It's a good, meaningful callback while having enough of its own flavor to stand on its own two feet, which isn't always the case in Dark Souls 3. 
But with Soul of Cinder, it sure is. Especially because he does have two feet. It's kind of funny to look back on the launch days of Dark Souls 3. Back then, Nameless King was heralded as the peak of video game difficulty. But after the Dark Souls 3 DLCs, Sekiro and Elden Ring, he's just another average boss difficulty-wise. No one would be talking about this boss's difficulty if he was in Elden Ring. Spectacle and big dickness wise though, he still holds up. I don't think I've ever seen anyone say they love the King of the Storm. In fact, I mostly see people say they hate it. I don't think it's very good either, but I wouldn't want him to not have it. It's such an iconic entrance and once you figure out the handful of moves it does, it's over in an instant. And for the first time players, you're just done celebrating your victory when you realize that was the easy part. The real fight is the little guy on the dragon, not the dragon itself. The greatest challenge about the king for me is how unclear it is when the combos end. And if you're late to punish him by a millisecond, he'll probably have already started the next combo and you're locked in your animation and thus, you're butt fucked. So even if he's out difficultied by the likes of Melania and Ishin, he does still demand your full attention. He doesn't have the greatest complexity in his moves, they're pretty straightforward and readable, but they hit like a truck and every dodge feels precious for it. Plus, he's like a god of thunder, you're fighting him atop clouds, he uses golden lightning and a giant sword spear. He's fucking cool. Hail the king. The nameless one, not the turkey. When it comes to presentation of a boss, Radan is easily in the top 5 coolest of all time. People hold a festival of war in his honor and send groups of warriors to die at his hands. You see a cutscene prior hyping him up, and once you enter the battlefield, you only see him far in the distance before suddenly getting impaled by tree sized arrows. Then you and your boys charge into battle, and you see him riding on this hilariously tiny horse while wielding gravity powers and jumping into fucking space and crashing down as a meteor. I can't believe I said all that, and that this is real. I can't believe a boss this ridiculous exists, but it's fucking amazing. And for the first few playthroughs he was pretty fucking tough. I felt like I did something really badass when I beat him without summons. But those days are long gone for me unfortunately. I'm not sure if it's because he's been nerfed at some point, but nowadays I feel like if I summon NPCs it's like cheesing. They just melt his health. And even when it is just me and the boss, he's quite simple. He doesn't have many combo variations, whenever he starts an attack you can pretty much guess where it's gonna go and what he'll follow it up with. But even if the challenge hasn't aged for me, the fun is still absolutely there. There's no other boss in the series that functions the same way as Radan. Even in comparison to the few other horseback bosses, he's 100% unique. He can stomp his horse under the ground, create giant gravity waves that you can jump over, and his double tornado attack through the air is one of the best looking moves in the series. Radan is fucking awesome. My dear, my dear, even after Elden Ring and all its trillion dragon bosses, you are without any question the king of all dragon bosses in the series. Placidus X was good, but other than that I feel they missed the magic that made Midir work so well. Do you know how you can make a massive boss that moves around everywhere make sense? You give them a weak point, in this case, the head. That way you never have to worry about getting stuck underneath him or tickling his feet while you can't see the rest of his body. You can just stay in front of him, dodge the attacks, and wait for the head to remain still, which Midir purposely does after every attack. Every single move has a punishable window. Even when he breathes fire on the ground, which is typically done to force you away from the boss, you can still run right back in and stab him in the face. His attacks are very fairly telegraphed, his hitboxes are perfect in my opinion, I would say it's one of the most fair fights in the series, but it's often been regarded as the hardest boss in Dark Souls 3. I never really felt that way. Back when The Ringed City first came out, people just didn't know how to fight him. Everyone for some reason kept trying to clip his nails or pat his tail and called it bullshit when the tactic failed. Thankfully, I think most of the Midir hatred is in the past. I would say my one complaint is how the fight is structured. You fight Midir for like a solid 2-3 to three minutes before he transitions into phase 2, which ends much quicker because if you've been hitting his head you can do a repost which does tremendous damage. And the music takes a drastic turn and sounds chaotic and epic, but nothing's really changed. He just sometimes summons these little homing humanities. He does have the super laser move, but I think I've seen it a total of 3 times in my life. Mostly he just does phase 1 moves. I don't know, maybe I'm just really unlucky. Inner Genichiro is the super version of Genichiro that was added in a boss rush update to Sekiro. 
so to anyone who hasn't done those, do them! The base version of this boss was a pivotal point in the game, and for a lot of people, the get good boss. But I always found him a bit too easy on repeat plays. His last phase in particular lasts like 20 seconds. So I'm really glad they picked this guy to be upgraded with Sakura Dance, one of the most satisfying attacks to deflect, and one of the most terrifying ones to be hit by. As well as upping his aggression and combo variations, health and posture, and greatly upping his lightning skills, so that now when you try to use this lightning against him, he'll send it right back at you. I do have a little problem with the arena though. Genichiro tends to only create distance by jumping or dashing backwards, so even if you're not trying, he'll very often end up backing himself into a corner where he's much less dangerous. They should've just given him Sword Saints Arena, which was actually originally Genichiro's at the very start of the game, so hey, makes sense to use it, I think. Either way, I really love this fight, and I'm really sorry for putting him too low in the ranking series. Twin Princess is another fight that seems absolutely ridiculous on paper, it being two cripple brothers and one is riding on the other one's back. And yet, when you do the fight, it's not laughable, it's just cool and a unique little gimmick. Lorian, the big brother on his own, is pretty good, but it's mostly just there to ease you into the real battle against the two of them. Which I wouldn't call a gank, but Lothric being there does alter your approach on the boss. If you kill Lorian, Lothric will revive him, so the goal should be to get as many hits in on Lothric as possible throughout the fight. Even though all the attacks of Lorian can be dodged without directional rolling mattering much at all, Lothric being the real target does add that aspect into the fight and that absolutely elevates it. Oh, and did I mention they teleport everywhere? That's how this fight remains active and fast despite their crippleness. That should win the accessibility award, just teleport the disabled. I love the teleporting though, especially how they can do it in the middle of a combo and have the finishing move come after teleporting. It is a bit of a dick move how they use it at the very very start of the fight though, and teleport right behind you and say nothing personal kid. Market was the boss that made us more git good, and by the time we face Morgoth, we've more got good already, and unfortunately he's curb stomped by most players. I would, no joke, double this boss's health, and increase his poise, dude staggers like my 92 year old grandma. I mean, why is he so weak? He's the boss separating mid game from end game, defeating him should feel like an actual achievement, kind of like defeating Ornstein and Smo or Pontiff Sullivan. So you might be wondering, why is Morgoth this high up if he's so pathetic? Because his moveset is absolutely perfect, 10 out of 10. I wouldn't change anything about it. In fact, he was my number one boss in the original Elden Ring ranking I did, and if he just had more health, he could have maintained it. I love his holy magic weapons, it's such a cool ability and gives him incredible variety. He can be super swift with the daggers that he tends to use as full ops that you basically need to memorize in order to react to them, flashy with double swords, like look at him fucking go, devastating with a giant hammer, which he can spin around like crazy, and reach you from across the city with his spear. And when it rains, it pours swords. And generally, he's very mobile and active and dances all around the place. I love his mix of agility with deliberately delayed attacks. Dodging them at the last frame just feels beautiful. And it's just fucking fun, man, basically. I often equip shitty weapons so I do less damage so that I can enjoy the fight longer, and I really wish I didn't have to do that. FromSoft, please make inner Morgoth and call him Merugut or something. Thank you. There's nothing I love Morg than Morg, except 10 other bosses, but that's besides the point. He's a trident-wielding, blood god-worshipping pedophile who lays a curse on you throughout his first phase, which might be a little dull nowadays because it's just phase 2, but less. But at least it is a good teaching tool for what is to come, and the music and his countdown do help making it feel worth going through. But the real reason we are all here, the real reason Morg is on this list, is of course his second form where he grows wings and each of his trident attacks leaves trails of flaming blood everywhere. And a lot of people complain about it. Long second place is awful. He's like one of the most known bosses in the game and probably in the entire series. He has no things and just sends his attacks over and over and then fly up in the air. Then spam again so you can't hit him at all. And don't get me started on the fire blood shit that coats the floor and is impossible to avoid because you have to focus entirely on Mog. I think Mog's blood trails are great. If you stand in the fire, it's not immediately game over, it's just something that punishes you if you do it too much over the course of the fight. 
I find this mechanic adds to the fight since you have to kind of visualize in your mind roughly where the flaming blood should be after each of his attacks, because you can't actually see where it goes all the time since his trident is pretty fucking big. But it's not like you have to fully focus on either the boss or the fire, you can let one brain cell focus on one and another cell focus on the other. I guess some people only have one brain cell to spare, so fair enough. He's not one of those bosses who's mostly fast but then suddenly pulls out a super delayed attack to trick you, instead all of his attacks are delayed. It's a different pace that you have to adjust to and it feels great once you do. I love his claw swipe explosion that he often follows up with the charged up charge. All the explosions can be just iframed and I find that fun. The flying up in the air, tossing boiling blood and swooping back down is a nice signature move and adds some theatricality. There are tiny issues here and there, like why does the face transition do damage even when you have the item for negating it, and the stairs are awful to fight on. As for big complaints, I have knee heal. So one of the last gang fights, along with headless apes, but let's not talk about that one, before Elden Ring was the demons in Ringed City. Which makes it all the more baffling what the fuck went wrong. How do you go from one of the best ganks in the series into whatever the hell they did in Elden Ring? So what was it that made this one work? Well, the dynamic between the two bosses made perfect sense. Most of the fight one of the demons would be in a weakened state and could only spew poison from afar, while the other one remained aggressive. Then at points both become aggressive or weakened at the same time for brief moments, providing you with more intense or laid back periods of time. It's very well done, but that whole thing is pretty much completely overshadowed by Demon Prince, the second form. And I can see why, because it's one of their best non-humanoid single target bosses ever. From a visual standpoint, it's one of my all-time favorites. There's fire everywhere, explosions, lasers, and the demon itself looks awesome. Those wings are so fucking big! There's also minor changes in phase 2 depending on which demon you killed first. Demon in pain super move is summoning a barrage of meteors that will one-shot you unless you interrupt him in time, while demon from below's is a laser light show. I guess in comparison to some of the others in this video there's not a whole lot of depth to how you avoid the attacks. Just dodge. Demon in pain does have some more interesting abilities, but demon from below's ultimate is just free damage basically. But what this fight gets more right than honestly any boss in Elden Ring in my opinion was just the grandness. It's so dramatic and epic, and it's only the first boss in the Ringed City. So we're finally at a Bloodborne boss, and is it any surprise that it's an old Hunter's DLC boss? If you ask me, this DLC is when FromSoft began making actually legendary boss fights, and they started off with some of the best of all time, including Orphan of course, this weird shrieking newborn old man baby alien wielding a placenta. Usually phase 1 of a boss is kind of just a warm up, a lesser version of the second phase, but often of course has probably the second best first phase in the series. There's one other boss that I think has a better start, but we'll get to that soon enough. Orphan's use of the placenta is great, it's like a yo-yo flail that can be thrown, swung around or used as a mallet. He's extremely aggressive and generally punishes you for trying to get away, so your best defense is to match his aggression and get right up in his ass. It's almost perfect, if it wasn't for his aforementioned ass. It's maybe a little too easy to get backstabs and completely anally destroy him. But at the same time, it is very satisfying to do so, so I'm not sure if I really dislike it. I generally want to make it harder for myself, but when he's got his ass exposed like that for me, I can't help myself. As for phase 2, it has some of the highest highs of the fight, but also some of the lowest lows. Potentially. Whenever he's focusing on melee attacks, it's great fun, but sometimes all he does is fly up in the air and give you easy backstabs. If this was more consistent, I could put Orphan of course closer to top 5. But when it is firing on all cylinders, it's one of the most intense, engaging fights ever crafted. Frida is definitely a more divisive boss than most on this list, I would say. There was a lot of frustration about the length of the fight and how different each phase was and that she's too fast and can't be hit. But for me personally, my biggest complaint is the floating candles. I mean, it's been like what, 4 to 5 years? Why are they still floating? They always do, it's something that gets fucked up by the cutscene transition and it's never been fixed. But I guess that goes to show how little I dislike about the actual fight. At first she's not the most thrilling, flashy battle of all time, but it's good that they introduce the invisibility mechanic and force you to learn it, which will help you a little bit in phase 2 and a little bit more in phase 3. Ariandel and Frida is a classic gank of one being fat and slow and the other fast and small. 
Not only that, but Frida tends to stay back and set icicles at you while Ariandel kindly comes over to you to let you spank him. It's usually over very quickly, but especially after the atrocities committed by FromSoft in the form of gang fights in Elden Ring, I have grown to appreciate it for what it is. And then we have Black Flame Frida, who is one of the fastest, coolest and hardest fights in the entire Dark Souls franchise. There are times when I do feel like I should have been allowed to get a hit in from time to time, but 9 times out of 10 I'm happy with her mobility. She alternates between being very spammy with the double scythes, to slowing down and spreading ice everywhere while trying to stay away from you, to suddenly exploding with massive black flames. It's a great ride. Alright, let's talk about how awesome Ludwig is. He's the boss that made me buy Bloodborne. Not just Bloodborne, but PS4, just to be able to play it. As soon as I saw that fucking cutscene, I was sold. It is still, to this day, my favorite video game cutscene of all time. No joke, no exaggeration. What helps build up that moment is the first phase of the fight, which is you versus a grotesque nightmare horse monster. I don't love fighting this thing, but it is top-notch in terms of executing the theme they were going for. Just listen to the sound it makes as it's about to charge you. It's unironically a scary boss with a super cool design. There's not a trace of humanity left on this thing, but at half health he gets knocked down and the music suddenly stops and creeps back in with a completely different, eerie yet holy tone. And you see that the other side of Ludwig's face is human. It's been there all along, just not something you'll notice in the heat of the fight. And what else has been there all along is his sword. And with the power of his giant moon lightsaber, he regains his humanity. A feat no other boss in the bleak world of Bloodborne has been able to achieve. And you have this ridiculous duel with a towering special effects galore. And by this point the music has transitioned from sounding a little eerie to sounding triumphant and it's just perfect. I haven't talked about the gameplay yet, but it is good. It's definitely weaker than, say, Frida, but there's just about enough to keep it fun to this day. It is a tad unfortunate how easily you can melt him, especially because he has scripted staggers and a really long, easy-to-exploit super attack. But from a thematic standpoint, this will probably always be my favorite and most memorable boss. Ooh, I can just feel the heat that's coming my way for this placement. I got some complaints just for having Gale as number two instead of number one in the ranking series. So, uh, I'm fucked. But let me explain even if you won't agree. Slave Knight Gale was for a long time, for a good reason, my favorite boss of all time. It's you versus your old buddy in the ruins of the world with nothing but ash and corpses everywhere and he's long since lost his mind and fights like a feral half-human with mostly just raw strength. There's only one ability he has that has a sliver of magic tied to it. It's a fun fight, a very solid intro, but what's the hook for keeping it interesting, unpredictable? Mostly it's just this. Is he gonna do one sword attack? Or two? His second stage, where he's now kind of regained his senses, I guess, is even more simple. But I can give it a pass because it's mostly to warm you up for the final third of the boss. It introduces the cloak that's going to mimic every sword attack he does, causing a lingering hitbox that emphasizes perfect timing and direction. And that's great. The cloak is by far the strongest aspect of this entire fight, along with the music, which is amazing all throughout. It's another one of my favorites. And then we have him jumping around, firing an automatic crossbow in the air and unleashing souls that will call down lightning from the skies, making for the most thrilling conclusion to a boss in Dark Souls 3. It's really cool, really fun, but I must admit that the days of me getting goosebumps and sweaty while fighting this guy are far in the past. I still have to pay attention to the cloak, and like I said, that's great. It just, in terms of variety and unpredictability, there are better fights out there. Not everyone's gonna care about that, I know, but I do, and it's my video. It's still high S tier, don't think I'm shitting on Gale, I'm just explaining why it's not quite number one. Melania was unironically my least favorite Elden Ring boss when I first fought her. I thought the life stealing made progressing the fight really frustrating and the infamous waterfowl dance was always instant death for me because I couldn't for the life of me figure out a consistent way to avoid it. And all this was before I even knew she had a second health bar. And I know a lot of people had the same unpleasant experience and I don't think time has fully changed my mind about the poor choices for first time players. But as a stubborn person, I eventually forced myself to learn her to the point that I can do it, no damage, and new game plus 7. That's not to boast, I'm not really a good player, I'm just really stubborn. And now I can confidently say, I love this boss. 
And it's not because I hate women and love beating them, Polygon. Though, that does help, admittedly. I think the way her patterns work, the spacing and directional rolling and all the demanding stuff you need to pull off is fantastic. One unique aspect to the entirety of the encounter is how she reacts to getting hit. She'll often either back away, block or do a swift kick. Because of that, when you use a slow weapon, she's a bit slower herself. But if you're using something like a katana, god damn, it's non-stop back and forth. It's actually kind of easier with a slower weapon, if you can believe it. And I have to say, the Goddess of Rot is one of my all-time favorite phases. I love the butterfly explosions and the music has really grown on me over time. It has this unsettling yet beautiful fairy-like atmosphere which fits her perfectly. I'm even at the point where waterfowl dance isn't a problem most of the time. I think it's kind of fair once you know what to do. I just run the opposite direction and then jump, then dodge through and the final hit kinda goes over you and you just need to take a few steps back and you're good. My actual least favorite attack is the Aeonian Bloom. She tends to always do it when she's low on health and there's nothing interesting about it. You just run away from it and then stand there for a while until it's over. So again, if you've played Elden Ring a couple of times, I can understand if you despise this boss. But if you're as stupid as me, keep trying. The boss might just eventually click for you. I know I'm a bigger Lady Maria enjoyer than most, and that's fine. It is my solemn duty to be correct when no one else is. Lady Maria is so good, so fun, and so replayable that over time she's become my favorite Bloodborne fight, even slightly more so than Ludwig. Main complaints about her is that she's on the easier side of the S-tier bosses and can be annihilated with parries. Personally, I don't find parrying her to be very satisfying, so I'm not tempted to do it. So I just don't. And honestly, I think moveset-wise, she's not that easy. In her intro phase, sure, you can avoid most of her attacks by just strafing, but as soon as she whips out the extended blood blades, it's intense as shit. Not only can she do near instant attacks, but her range and poise are greatly increased. And it's one of those fights where you can't just iframe the attack any way you like, you've gotta dodge towards the side she began the animation from. Which gets even more re-emphasized in the very final phase with the addition of fire. And this progression is what I love the most about her. She already introduces the double blade over the shoulder swing in phase 1, where her increased poise forces you to learn to dodge it. Then they keep upping the challenge as the fight goes on, making it more and more punishing to fail that attack. She's also the first boss to introduce these supercharged up attacks that would later be put to use by certain Sekiro bosses. They're a lovely addition for some variety to her otherwise very speedy moveset. Her soundtrack is also in my top 3 favorites across the whole franchise. It's just a perfect fit for the tragedy and beauty of this encounter. So, you know when I said Orphan of Kos has the second best first face? Well, here you have THE best first face. Godfrey, the first Elden Lord! Absolute giga chat. It's not as erratic and challenging as Orphan, I'll give you that. He's quite slow and methodical, but it's so clean. It's like a better Dark Souls 3 boss. The only tiny little flaw is how, after he struck his axe to the ground and is about to stomp on it to create a massive sundering, he's somehow still able to track you and turn the axe towards you. Now you could say he's so strong and badass that of course it being stuck in the ground wouldn't stop him, but if so, there's no effect or animation that would support that idea. So it's just a little love. But I don't have an issue with the attack itself, it's really fun, over the top and satisfying to avoid. It's just the realism that's off. And I do realize I'm talking about Elden Ring here, but still. But I love the heavy weight of each of his attacks, the shockwaves you can jump over, as well as the increase in difficulty by buffing his stomps to now reach you from literally across the entire arena. It is actually impossible to just get out of range, you have to roll or jump. But as if having the best first phase wasn't enough, he has the manliest phase transition of all time. And this is one of the better, drastically different face changes they've done. The only thing he carries over is the stomps that he also buffs halfway through. The unfortunate thing about the Hora Lu half is that you can greatly simplify his moveset by always dodging behind him. This way he'll most of the time only do one attack at a time and then be vulnerable for a punish. Which is why I mostly dodge backwards, even though that does make it harder. It just lets him show how goddamn cool his combos can be. The giant ground eruption is at first just one of those AoEs you run away from, but I like how after buffing you have to dodge his hand slams twice. You've seen the animation before, so it's not unfair to expect you to be able to avoid it at any distance. I will admit though that I am 100% biased on this boss. This is objectively not a better designed boss than like Melania, but it's just something that clicks for me. I love the animations, the stomps and the slams and the pure savagery. 
So for number two, we have Ishin, both the inner version and the base version. Inner has very minor changes, but the ones that are there are pretty good. His first phase has been made a little more buggy and messy, with him sometimes cancelling his own animations, but he mostly only does that if you're attacking him. So the solution is to instead play defensively and focus on deflecting, which fits the theme of this methodical katana versus katana duel. What does katana mean? It means Japanese sword. It's often very brief regardless if it's inner or not, but I must admit, I always find it really fun. Then he has probably the lamest face transition out of any final boss in these games. He just stomps, grabs a polearm out of the soil, was it like laying there all this time? Did he bring it over from the realms of the dead or something? It just seems like he pulled it out of his ass. But nevertheless, I'm glad he did, because Ishin dual wielding a katana and a polearm is one of the most intense and enjoyable battles fucking ever. He still maintains some more standard katana moves from phase 1, but mixes them up with the slower swings and pokes of the halberd. And like I had mentioned, he can sometimes pull off the Lady Maria-esque supercharged slashes. And if you found pairing those to be satisfying in Bloodborne, it's even more so in Sekiro. They do damage even if you block, the only way to negate it is to run away or do a perfect deflect. And even when you do deflect, the power of the attack is so strong it pushes you back. It's so good. He's also got a Glock now, did I mention that? I, I guess that's neat. And finally, there's the lightning reversal phase, which is kind of a victory lap phase. At least if you've learned that mechanic. It's easy to melt his health here because of how much damage the lightning does, but he still has his entire phase 2 moveset, plus a couple wind slices, so it's still engaging, and the lightning does make for a more climactic final boss. Inner Father was the number one boss in my ranking series, and uh, yeah, he still is because he is simply the best designed boss fight FromSoft has pooped out, and I'm eager to see if they'll ever top it. I'll get this out of the way, yes, the arena does suck. Not only is it reused, but the pillars can screw up the camera or the boss's pathing, but besides that, I think the boss is basically perfect. The base version of Alfather is a top 20 worthy boss alone, but with the handful of changes made to him in the boss rush update, this version has pretty much replaced that fight for me. I love that he can use more shinobi abilities like Mist Raven to disappear and reappear with a quick ambush that punishes you for recklessly attacking him, but my favorite mechanic was always the Spirit Owl that he can use to fly around and then drop down on you for a surprise attack. As if that wasn't cool enough, if you do manage to deflect it, he'll do a follow-up attack that's either a swipe or a slow overhead slam, and evading them is very helpful in bringing his health and posture down. I would go as far as to say this is my favorite ability from a boss in the franchise. I just think it's so unique, cool and dynamic. Not only is timing rewarded, but so is managing to keep track of where the Spirit Owl is flying, and then the inner version has him upgraded with another incredibly fun combo where he teleports around with the Mist Raven. And again, if you deflect the last hit, he'll do the same full of attacks as with the Spirit Owl ambush. And outside of that, he has excellent mobility, attack patterns so varied that I still can't remember all the alternatives and have to actually react in the moment. This boss is a bitch to unlock, but I recommend you do it. Well, I think that about wraps it up. Thanks for watching! Feel free to join my Discord server where we have a channel specifically for discussing Soulsborne. You might enjoy arguing with people there. Or you can do that in the comments. I mean, you do that anyway. Onus, as I thought. Nihil! Art of passing Nihil. valor. Nihil.